We shall begin our evening going through Micah chapter 2. Um, you'll notice on the, I, I, on the packets back there, if you didn't grab one, I'd recommend you grab one. Not necessarily because um, a copy of like my notes are in there. Jim asked uh, if, if I would scan those out and just give them to you. And that's actually, I, I don't really have teaching notes as much as we're just going to walk through this anyway. So that, that'll be helpful to kind of have all that stuff in front of you. But the far more valuable thing is this little diagram. Um, I didn't draw it. I wish I did. This is um, just a really helpful visual representation of the book of Micah and of um, how, how, the, how, how it's arranged, how, um, how this part connects to that part and what the overarching story is. These, there's a, there's a, um, a guy, I, I can't remember his name, Tim Mackey, I think, um, up in the Pacific Northwest who draws these and he's now completed his project. It's called the Bible Project. It took him years to do, but he's drawn one for every book of the Bible. And if you go to thebibleproject.com or .org, whatever, just search The Bible Project, you can go to his website. And each one of these um, little drawings, you can download them and you can actually print them rather large. Um, but they, they go with movies or, or a short YouTube video where he is explaining them. And so as he's drawing it, he's telling you what Micah did and how it connects to this one. And he, he explains everything that goes behind it. And... Um, I find it wonderfully helpful for me, and uh, my kids will sit and watch them for hours, because it's just, they're so engaging, and yet they, he's not pulling any punches. He's not talking at, at a childish level. He's talking like just as, as an, he would to an adult, but this cartoon way of representing the book is just so helpful. And in fact, when I'm studying a book or preparing to teach a series on a book, I always start here. And I kind of keep it tucked in the back of my Bible. And every now and then I just pull it out and say, okay, where are we in the map? Okay, we've come from here and we're moving towards there. And I see how the book ends. I need to keep that in mind as I'm working in chapter two. That certainly has something to do with chapters seven, six and seven. Okay, and, and it, it's so helpful. Um, I, I pin them up on my walls in my office. And uh, anyway, so tonight you can see we have the... Uh, the introduction up on the top left corner of the last couple of weeks, you guys have been talking about the background, how prophets, um, how they function in the ancient Near East, and how prophecy as a, as a literary genre works. And so you have some of the historical, geographical, cultural context right up there at the top. Um, and then right below that is, on, on the left side of the page, is chapters one and two, where as you guys have discussed over the last few weeks, God appears to judge his people. And then you see the cities that Mackenzie was talking about last week. And then you see right below that, still in that, that first box, is what we're going to be talking about tonight, asking why. And that's, that brings us to, to Micah chapter 2. Um, I hope that my... I, I, try, I don't normally write... Um, as slowly as I did for you guys. I knew that I would be copying these pages out. So I hope they're legible. If there's something that I'm referencing and we're just, we're not finding it, just raise your hand. This can be very interactive and, and I want to make sure that this is, this is helpful. So in Micah chapter 2, there's three sections. And, and it's not three distinct sections. It's three very tightly connected, interconnected sections. And we're going to, we're still in the part of the book, the early part of the book of prophecy where Micah is is explaining what is wrong. And he's making accusations, and he's making condemnations, and he's pronouncing judgments. And here we have two more sets of people that he is, he is prophesying against. And then we have this beautiful, hopeful third section. And so that's what we're going to be walking through tonight. Um, St. Augustine is a, uh, certainly one of the most famous theologians who have ever walked the earth. Fourth century, North Africa, um, did a whole lot of, I mean, just produced and produced and produced. Um, uh, if you ever hear someone describe Calvinism as a, like a way of thinking or Reformed theology as a way of thinking, that is a rebranded Augustinianism. St. Augustine is the father of that entire line of thinking. So a very, a, a very um, 
important figure in the church's theological development in the early um, uh, third and fourth centuries. But, so he wrote like his confessions where he's talking about working through his, his own sins, but his big, big, big book is The City of God. And he's talking about, it's, it's this, this very thinly veiled, he's not even trying to hide the, the illusions. There's the city of God and then there's the, the city of man or the city of the earth. And he just talks about the complexity of living inside the territory of one while being a citizen of the other. And he talks about how attractive the city of man is. But it's just founded on totally different principles. And to live like a citizen of this lower city, when you're actually a citizen of the, the, the city of heaven, is uh, it's just egregious in his mind. And here's, here's one short quote from the book. He says, two cities have been formed by two loves. The earthly by the love of self, even to the point of contempt of God. The heavenly city by the love of God, even to the point of contempt of self. And he's just saying that the two don't mix. It's this beautiful book. And what we have here in Micah 2 is we have... Micah's audience is supposed to belong to the heavenly city, and yet they're acting as citizens of the earthly city, and, that, and that's a big problem for him. They're supposed to love God first and foremost, and, and in so doing, deny themselves. And what we see is that they love themselves so much to the point that they are abusing their, their fellow humanity. And, uh, and, and Micah has some strong words to say to, um, to those. So this, this first section, the two judgments, is verses 1 through 11, and the, the first judgment hits from verses 1 through 5. Um, actually, let me just read through that whole section, uh, the first five verses, and then we'll, then we'll back up and work our way through it. So here's the accusation. Woe to those who devise wickedness. And work evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it because it is in the power of their hand. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them away. They oppress a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, against this family I am devising disaster from which you cannot remove your necks, and you shall not walk haughtily, for it will be a time of disaster. In that day they shall take up a taunt song against you and moan bitterly and say, we are utterly ruined. He changes the portion of my people, how he removes it from me. To an apostate he allots our fields, therefore you will have none to cast the line by lot in the assembly of the Lord. So we immediately see this picture of there's, there's some wickedness taking place. And, and we, we can look a little closer and understand what that wickedness entailed, though it's explained again later in the chapter. And it looks like there's going to be a response on the part of the Lord. So the accusation begins with, woe to those who devise wickedness. And I just wrote out to the side of that because I'm still working through it. Who is this? Who is it that devises wickedness? We need more information. And then I just started to put brackets around the things that they were doing that apparently are wicked. And they work, e so they devise wickedness and they work evil on their beds. Well, what does that mean? You have this contrast, because you'll see when the morning dawns right thereafter, you have this contrast of evil flourishes in darkness. It flourishes in the night. In fact, um, in Jewish tradition, they would hold courts, like legal proceedings, first thing in the morning. You know this from Jesus' crucifixion, right? From his sham of a trial and a crucifixion, they would have legal proceedings first thing in the morning because that's when you deal with the wickedness that's just taken place in the night. But it's also when we have the, the clarity of mind to, to judge rightly. It's when God's justice can be properly meted out. So we'll hold a court first thing in the morning. So, so, so those who are devising wickedness, they're working evil, in the, but they're laying awake, in a sense, devising, plotting, planning to do evil. And then 
If you're, if you're to hope for justice, if you're to hope that evil will meet its match, it comes in the morning. But it, it, the Micah really underscores just how that's simply not the case here because when the morning dawns and justice should rain down, they perform this evil because it is in the power of their hand. Um, you'll see as we go further that our context, we find out that these people are, um, I guess the best way that I can describe it is that they're land barons. Ancient titans of industry that are um, using their clout, their capital, their power, their influence to collect things for themselves, namely property, at the expense of others. And there's no justice that's coming in the morning against those who would um, abuse their kinsmen. It's almost as if this is a part of time in Israel's history where the idiom, might is right, rules. Whoever has the most clout can do what they would like. I, I believe, I, I didn't watch all of... Um, all of McKinsey's and, and Jim's introductory material, but I, I believe that they would have, they would have covered the fact that this um, this it, this point in Israel's history, this is a very prosperous and wealthy point in their history. Money is coming in. They've really expanded the territories, though that's starting to be chipped away by Assyria to the north. But there's a lot of money coming into this to this this nation, particularly the southern. Uh, Judah and Benjamin, the two southern tribes. And uh, what was once a collection of 12 tribes of largely agrarian, rural people is becoming metropolitan rather quickly. And, and you start to see the, the ill effects of industry as it develops and the ill effects of um, wealth as it starts to concentrate in certain areas and, and the, the wickedness, of, there's nothing wrong with wealth per se, but when wickedness attaches to it, well now you can leverage that wealth to do some considerable harm. So what do they do? Verse 2, they covet fields and they seize them and houses, and they take them away. They oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. Again, an agrarian society. You take away my fields. At best, I'm going to go from someone who is, um, can live a life of self-sustenance and, and provision and caring for my family. At best, I'm going to go into a life of more of a day laborer. Likely, I might even end up in the, in, enslaved to someone else. Israel was a strange nation state in the ancient world. If you look back at um, uh, is it Numbers, Joshua, where they divide up the land according to the size of the tribe, and, and this is your inheritance is how it's described. And if you have to parcel it up and sell it, it, the good news is there's this thing called the year of Jubilee. All debts are forgiven, and everybody's property is returned to their family. It's intended to sustain the nation under God's good care and provision and, and as a beacon of his blessing. And uh, that's being undone here. Their fields are right there to the side. The fields are their livelihood. And the theft of one's fields means enslavement. You see a similar complaint being levied in Amos 5. And, um, Isaiah, one of, one of Micah's contemporaries, actually deals with some very similar problems in his prophecies. Here's a, what one commentator said. I thought this was really interesting. He said, the economic and social ideal of ancient Israel was of a nation of free landholders, not slaves, sharecroppers, or hired workers. They were secure in possession as a grant from Yahweh himself with enough land to keep them and their families. That's how the, the nation was set up. And you have these powerful people that are starting to oppress, is what Micah says. Um, 
It sounds very similar, in fact, to Isaiah 5. Listen to this problem that Isaiah is, he's also pronouncing woes and judgment. This is Isaiah 5, verses 8 through 10. He says, woe to those who join house to house, who add field to field, in, in a sense, where my field comes up against Paul's field. I'm just going to kind of move my fence. I'm going to move my fence a little closer to him. I'm, I'm going to slowly annex the car property. This is actually, if you look in the, the Levitical law, why are there so many weird laws about not moving boundary markers, about not extending your fences beyond about even pulling your fence back and leaving a little bit on the edge for the journeyman or the, 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 the poor to take a little bit of your crop. It's just a way of God has blessed you with this property and you'll go and turn. But that's, that's what it means to live in a heavenly city where we love God. And in loving God, we love others. But we're seeing the, the earthly city take root, where we love ourselves chiefly and often at the expense of others. Isaiah says, what are those who join house to house and add field to field until there is no more room? And you are made to dwell alone in the midst of the land. The Lord of hosts has sworn in my hearing, surely many houses shall be desolate, in, in a sense, because of this judgment's coming. Large and beautiful houses without inhabitant. For ten acres of vineyard shall yield but one bath, and a homer of seed shall yield but an ephah. In other words, when you operate in this wicked way, the one who sends the rain, who grows the crops, who makes the sun shine, is no longer going to bless your fields. And he's not going to here either. So in verse 3, the accusation comes in verses 1 and 2. Verse 3, the sentence is levied, and you can see that little arrow going back up. So when it says, therefore, it means that what we're about to read is happening in light of what we've just read. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, against this family. And that's a strange choice of words, because there's no indication that these are, this is like one family. But it seems as though the society is corrupt to the point that the family of Israel is going to have to pay some consequences. Against this family, I am devising disaster. You can see that circle, I'm devising disaster. It goes back up to devising witness, uh, wickedness up front. It's amazing how when you want to pull one over on God, you're just not going to outdo him. Woe to those who devise wickedness. And just a few short verses later, the Lord says, I can devise a pretty good disaster myself if you want to play the game. There's a presumptuousness to those who would mock the Lord in such a brazen, self-centered, and oppressive way. I am devising disaster from which you cannot remove your necks. That judgment is certain. And you shall not walk haughtily. Their pride will be shattered. For, another connecting word, so this is explaining it with that judgment. It will be a time of disaster. In that day they shall take up a taunt song against you and moan bitterly and say, so this is Assyria and you can write even Babylon there. It'll be Assyria chipping away for quite some time. Um, and then with some reform from the south, they will be um, spared for another 100 plus years before in 587, 586, Babylon comes and levels Jerusalem. But here's the, like, they're singing a bit of a funeral song, but it's mocking. It's the, if, if, I wish we could, I, I want to, like, make a, a Bible translation that, I love Old Testament quotes being in bold. There's certain Bible translations that have that, the Christian Standard Bible. I love that they do that. I can see where it's talking about the Old Testament. I don't know if we need to do, like, green text or something but where it's sarcastic language and I'm just not catching the tone, you know. I, I wish that I, I would do that here because this is a very sarcastic little song where Assyria, Babylon, they moan bitterly. Oh, we are utterly ruined. He changes the portion of my people, how he removes it from me to the apostate he allots our fields. That's the enemy singing that song. That's the apostate singing that song. Oh, 
we feel so bad for you, Israel. They gave your property to the evil people. Ha. That's the, that's the tone here. And, you know, further up there by verse 4, I just wrote, you know, go compare to Matthew 26. We had this little line that he who lives by the sword shall die by the sword. Those who plot wickedness, who plot disaster against other people, it's not shocking to me when the Lord returns disaster on them. And their enemies mock them. And then you have this conclusion in verse 5. Therefore, so in light of everything we've seen thus far, you will have none to cast the line by lot in the assembly of the Lord. Translation, um, after Assyria Babylon does their thing. And you can, it's just a little glimmer of hope. It's like there's going to be a time where we redivide the land, where we sort all this out again. So for the remnant, for the elect, there is hope. And for, those, for the wicked ones, for the ones who mistreat everyone, it says, and we're not going to even consult you. You don't get any. If, if I were to have like a New Testament sound to that, it would be like, and you've already received your reward. So we have these powerful people of industry or clout, political office, even the priesthood. There's, there's a very corrupt society. And you have this idea that, okay, you're mistreating everyone. You're, you're going to, to be punished. But he continues in verse 6. This is a new group of people. Um, this is, these are the false prophets. A big, big thing in, in the Old Testament, actually. Even a big thing today. Verse 6. Mike is quoting what they say. Do not preach. Preach is just a, uh, even a synonym for prophesy. You could actually use them rather interchangeably. Do not preach. Do not prophesy. That's what they preach to us, Micah says. Micah says they, they'll even say, one should not preach of such things. Disgrace will not overtake us. In other words, Micah he just has, he has a message that's kind of hard to stomach, and we don't like hearing it. And this, this disaster is not actually going to happen. So, the, the false prophets, the false teachers will say, stop preaching this stuff, Micah. False prophets take great delight, and I think it's even necessary for them to sustain their pseudo-ministry in silencing true prophets. At the time, you would have Micah and, and Isaiah prophesying very similar areas. Hosea at the same time. Um, even their own disciples. And uh, the popular prophets, the, the, uh, the, the, the theologians of the day that everyone really liked to listen to. Like, you need to stop with all the doom and gloom. You do know that like, that doesn't attract anyone to us. That's not even going to happen, Micah. These prophets were actually preaching against judgment. Um, verse 7. Should this be said, O house of Jacob, has the Lord grown impatient? Hmm. He continues. Are these his deeds? In, in verses 1 through 5. Is, is this actually the Lord? I thought the Lord was really patient. Why is he all of a sudden all upset at us? Isn't he so patient? False prophets had a rough go in the Old Testament. And at least eventually... But in the meantime, they made it hard on everybody else, particularly those who did know the Lord and spoke his truths with great conviction. First Kings has a couple of interesting, a couple of interesting stories here. With Elijah and Ahab, and even run-ins between Elijah and Jezebel, who really did not like Elijah's prophecies and wanted him dead. Um, in 1 Kings 18, it said, 
So Elijah needs to go. So after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. In the third year, saying, go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. There's been an incredible drought as punishment. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria, and Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. And when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. The, the true prophets were not even able to, to like have the option to not speak. Jezebel was on a rampage. Verse 5, And Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys. Perhaps we may find grass and save the horses and mules alive and not lose some of the animals. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went one direction by himself, and Obadiah went in another direction by himself. And as Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him. And Obadiah recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is it you, my lord Elijah? He was a very respected prophet, if you were interested in what the Lord was actually saying. Verse 8, And he answered him, It is I. Go tell your lord, behold, Elijah is here. And he said, How have I sinned that you would give your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? Ahab wasn't stable. As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my Lord is not sent to seek you. And when they would say he is not here, he would take an oath of the kingdom or nation that they had not found you. And now you say, go tell your Lord. Behold, Elijah is here. He's like, I, I don't think this is going to go well for me to bring this news that I found you. And as soon as I have gone from you, the Spirit of the Lord will carry you. I know not where. And so when I come and tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me. Although I, your servant, had feared the Lord from my youth. Has it not been told, my Lord, that I did what, what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord? How I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And now you say, go tell your Lord. Behold, Elijah is here and he will kill me. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Now, this is interesting. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is it you, you troubler of, e of, is of Israel? That's an interesting way to greet a prophet of the Lord, a true prophet. Hey, you troubler of Israel. Well, it's only trouble if you have no interest in listening to the Lord. If, if Elijah's prophecies are inconvenient to you, then I guess it is trouble. And Elijah answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have in your father's house because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals, the, the, the false gods. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Uh, Elijah basically calls for a showdown. and It doesn't go well for the prophets of Baal and Asherah. It's, a, it's an incredible story. I, if you just want to read like one fascinating account of God versus pseudo-God and prophets versus prophets and read, read the back half of 1 Kings 18. But you see, there's this, this distaste for those who speak the word of the Lord, who speak both of his love and mercy and of his judgment and righteousness. And that's a great, that's a, that's a, a very constant quality in the false prophets. False prophets are all over the Old Testament, particularly 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, the historical books. You see these false prophets, and they have the king or queen's ear. But it's just because they say things that tickle those ears. They don't say hard things. That's why they're popular. And the real messengers from the Lord have a difficult go. In 1st Kings 22... You have this other prophet, Micaiah. Um, so just by way of summary, so we don't read the whole thing. The king of Judah, his name is Jehoshaphat, and he wants to go to war in the region of Syria. He's, there's a prop, an area of land that he wants to he wants to go up, and, and Ramoth Gilead is, is, is he's like, I'll, I want to take over that and add it to my kingdom. And so he's like, okay, he's talking to his advisors, and he's, 
Let's talk to the prophets. Let's ask the prophets if we should do this. And all the all of his prophets, you know, that he keeps in the in the, the close to the throne is, oh yeah, do it. Victory is certain, absolutely. And one guy's like, um, should we ask maybe one more? Like, is there <laughs> is there like a man of God here? I know we're talking to these prophets, but is there a man of God that we should consult? And uh, <laughs> the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat. There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, but I hate him, for he never prophesies good concerning me, but evil. I hate him. He only ever says negative things. So he sends for Micaiah, and uh, he shows up. The messenger went to summon Micaiah and said to him, Behold, the words of the prophets with one accord are favorable to the king. He's kind of a little pre-meeting pep talk. All right. Here's what all the prophets have said. And they've all said the same thing. You need to get your story straight and you need to say the same thing. And this is again where if I had my way, this, this part of my Bible would have some green sarcastic text. He says, Let your word be like the word of one of them and speak favorably, Micaiah. But Micaiah said, as the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, that I will speak. Okay? And then he goes into the king, and the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we refrain? <laughs> and Micaiah answered him, Oh yeah, go up and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hand of my king. Go do it. Sounds great. And then you know it's sarcastic, because the king said to him, How many times shall I make you swear that you speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? He's like, I know you're lying. I know you're lying when you say that this is going to go fine. And Micaiah said, actually, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let each return to his home in peace. In other words, yeah, you're going to lose and you're going to die. That's the actual prophecy. So Micah's plight here is not uh, it's not unusual. It's actually rather typical when you have false prophets um, speaking to leaders or to powerful people and you have someone who actually does speak the truth no matter how difficult it may be. Let's just write that guy off. I don't like listening to that. And what you run into here, and this is going to be, uh, so we're going to kind of fill in some of these things in your, in your handout. You have... The difference or the integration of what we've, we've called them orthodoxy. And orthodoxy's connection to orthopraxy. Now we talk about these a lot, but let's just make sure. So ortho means right or straight or regular. Doxy is belief, like a doxological phrase or like a song, like the doxology. That's a, that's a little song of belief. It's... Right belief should result in right practice. Right praxis or right practice, right living. Right belief should result in right living. And of course the opposite is true. Improper belief results in inappropriate living. So what kind of belief results in lives that do this kind of stuff to people? that take advantage of people and oppress and ignore the word of the Lord and, and try to get rid of all the prophets that actually speak the truth. Well, it's these people with this false theology because they said, has the Lord grown impatient? You see, they have this concept that says that God is, um, he is only ever kind. He is only ever merciful. He is only infinitely patient. False prophets, false teachers, bad preachers, anyone who would lead us away from the things of the Lord, they, they are very presumptive. They look at their election, they look at their status within the covenant and say, it is so certain, I can now do whatever I want. And the only problem with that is the unbelievable track record of the Lord disciplining that person. Like, we're Israel. We're the chosen ones. You probably even have some that are so brash as to say, hey, I'm part of the priesthood. It's very presumptive. But these false prophets, they ask, has the Lord grown impatient? Are these his deeds? Um, 
You know, Israel was actually complicit in the sins of the false prophets because their job was to get rid of them. False prophets were actually to be executed. And you have these huge groups of them that develop and not only do we not deal with them, we now entertain them and love them and hang on their every fluffy word. Their theology is flawed, however. And I really think that their theology is built on this great promise in Exodus 34. There's never, never a wrong thing to believe if, you're, if you can believe what the scriptures actually say in their entirety. But in Exodus 34, you know this. The Lord passed before Moses. This is Exodus 34, verse 6. The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed the Lord... So this is right after Israel has made the golden calf, right? So this is a big no-no. But he says, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Keeping steadfast love for thousands. Now, maybe the people of Micah's day look at that and say, See, he'll never get tired of us. No matter how flawed we might be, we don't even necessarily feel like we're doing all that bad, but he'll, he's, he's got an infinite well of patience. But how often is something good and proper skewed because you stopped reading a little too soon? Because it continues in verse 7. Keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Oh, God is so patient. It's like, ah, you stopped reading about two sentences too early. He will forgive the repentant. But the brazen, those who, who rain down iniquity on others, they're asking, are those his deeds? But God says, do not, this is Micah speaking for God, do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly. In other words, don't, aren't my blessings conferred on the righteous? Israel, you're not perfect. Perfection's never actually called for. But you are to be holy, a holy nation of priests. You are to be righteous. And so God said, yeah, of course I'm patient and kind. My words do good to him who walks uprightly. And then you have the second round of accusations against these prophets. Verse 8, but lately my people have risen up as an enemy. And then he describes this, the, the, the abuse. So in verse 1, he talks about wickedness and they're, they're taking people's things, their houses, their fields. They're oppressing people in their house. They're taking their inheritance. We get a little more of the picture here in verse 8. Lately, my people have risen up as an enemy. You strip the rich robe from those who pass trustingly with no thought of war. That just calls to mind immediately the Joseph narrative. You took advantage of someone who thought that they were among brothers. He says, with no thought of war, who would walk through Jerusalem thinking they have to watch out from these other Jewish people, these other followers of God, Yahweh worshipers? Why do I have to protect myself here? This is home. You have to imagine Joseph had a similar thought running through his mind as his brothers take his coat and throw him in a well. That's what you're doing here. You're, you're, you're taking advantage of people. The powerful are preying on the defenseless. And then it gets even worse. The women of my people, you drive out from their delightful houses. From their young children, you take away my splendor forever. Then the judgment is levied. Through Micah, God says, arise and go. Translate that. Get out of here. If you, my blessing to you was the nation. My blessing to you was the land. My blessing was security, peace, in one of the most treasured locations in the world at that time. International trade routes, armies wanted to march through there. It's like the perfect location, and I gave it to you. And you have abused people, and now I'm taking it away. Get out. It says, for this is no place to rest. They've been sentenced. 
Exile is the name of the game. They've broken the covenant. And he said, you will no longer find rest and peace here. And I just kind of drew a circle around that and then a line over. Where do you find rest and peace? In your home. You've taken other people's homes. I find rest and peace when I have my land and it's well cared. You've taken other people's land. I find rest and peace in the temple. I'm about to level that temple. Those who live by the sword die by the sword, it seems. Because of uncleanness, uh, uncleanness that destroys with a grievous destruction. That's a fascinating choice of words on the Lord's behalf. Uncleanness. That is ritual defilement. That is, you are unfit to be in my presence. Think of the Levitical Code and how often cleanliness is a thing. And how, how often it, it, it forces one to, at least for a time, be removed from the presence of God. You can't go into the tabernacle. You cannot go into places of prayer. You, you have to deal with your lack of holiness, your uncleanness. It just says how perfect God is. He says, what you guys have done has made you unclean. You are ritually impure. You, can't, you are no longer fit to be in my presence. And that very fact will destroy you with a grievous destruction. I love the superlative, a grievous destruction. And then Micah says, what kind of prophets would flourish in a place like this? He says, if a man should go about and utter wind and lies, saying nice things, I will preach to you of wine and strong drink. Um, it, could, it could even be translated wine and beer or wine and mead. I mean, uh, what it symbolizes is the blessing the fruitfulness of vineyards and of honey. And you have preachers coming and saying, yep, the Lord is going to bless us. There's going to be vineyards all over the place. We will have as much wine as we could possibly want. And we're we're going to have, we're going to even be able to make mead. We're going to have, in the land of milk and honey, we're going to have tons of honey. And Micah says, even though that's not even true, and we're all about to take it on the chin for our lack of faithfulness to the covenant, you'll still tell people that it's going to be good. That's the kind of prophets you guys are interested in. They're just blowing wind and telling lies. And the Lord is no longer going to bless this place. He said, he would be the preacher for this people. He's the one you guys would really like. So you can see that line right there between 11 and 12. And then above that to the left I wrote, verses 1 through 11 are all about the judgment. Verses 12 and 13, though, are all about hope. This is the divine promise that God will gather his flock. Well, I'm just going to read this straight through and then we'll talk about it. I will surely, this is verse 12, I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture, a noisy multitude of men. He who opens the breach goes up before them. They break through and pass the gate going out by it. And then it ends, their king passes on before them, the Lord at their head. So judgment's coming. However, there is a glimmer of hope. And so you can group um, verse 12 and just under the idea that Yahweh is going to gather in his people. And then in verse 13, it says that Yahweh is going to deliver his people. It's like God goes and, and the faithful, the remnant, he gathers back into Jerusalem. And then, problem still isn't dealt with. And in verse 13, it seems as though he's going to take them and he's going to deliver them, leading the charge. The shepherd language is, in, is a very important lang, uh, type of language in the Old Testament, particularly in the prophetic books. Um, Isaiah 40, verse 11, puts it this way. Just look at how similar all this language is. I'm going to actually going to start in verse 10. Behold, this is Isaiah's prophecy. This is in you know, Isaiah's uh, book is grouped around the first 35 chapters are all about judgments, and then 36, 37, 38, and 39 are the narrative 
account of, I think Mac even talked last week about Sennacherib coming down and Hezekiah and all that stuff. And then verses, or chapters 40 through the end, 66, are all about the future glory that's to come and all about the deliverance that's to come. So we're just now into that section in chapter 40 here. Verse 10, behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. This is a popular image for describing God here in the Old Testament. And if you flip over to Jeremiah 31, the great new covenant chapter of Jeremiah's prophecies. Verses 8 through 10. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth. So his people have been scattered. The remnant has been scattered, but God is going to bring them. Among them, the blind, the lame, the pregnant woman, and she who is in labor together, a great company, they shall return. Here he's gathering them back in. With weeping they shall come, and with pleas for mercy I will lead them back. I will make them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble for I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. And then verse 10, Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him. It's God, it, 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 it underscores God's agency, and he's the one who scattered Israel. Assyria wasn't all that powerful. Babylon wasn't impressive. God did this, and he's going to bring them back. He who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. The Lord has ransomed Jacob and has redeemed him from hands too strong for him. Ezekiel 34, another famous passage of um, God functioning as a shepherd. In Ezekiel 34, it's very similar to this, although the, the problem aren't land barons. The problem are actually the leaders of the nation. And God says, you guys have been terrible shepherds for my people. You've devoured them. You've abused my people. You are awful shepherds. And he doesn't say, I need better shepherds. He says, I will shepherd them. Um, where are we going to go? Verse 11. For thus says the Lord God, behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries. There's that gathering piece again. And will bring them into their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines and in the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. It's a beautiful picture. Um... I encourage you to go look at Psalm 78 at some point, but given the goodness of that Ezekiel 34 reference on God coming as the, uh, as the, the shepherd, it's good to read things like John chapter 6, verse 1. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Notice how much Ezekiel 34 talked about sick, sick lambs. Bind them up, care for them. They'll take them to graze on the mountains and in the ravines. Jesus went up on the mountain. And there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? 
He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? And Jesus said, have the people sit down. And look at what this little aside that John gives us. He says, now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. That's the shepherd tending his flock in the pasture. John has no reason to tell us that there was much grass. But it's the shepherd who is gathering in his flock and caring for them. And John pulls that thread a little further in John chapter 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep, talking about himself. To him, the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought, all of, brought out all his own, he goes before them. Verse 13 of Micah 2. He who opens the breach goes up before them. They break through and pass the gate going out by it. Their king passes on before them, the Lord at their head. Jesus says, When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Verse 14 of John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. In Micah 5.10, no, 5... Or, Micah tells us about something special coming from Bethlehem. And in verse 4, And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Micah 2.10, get out of here. This is no place of rest. In Micah 5.4, he shall be their peace. You have the shepherd language, you have the leadership or the military language. It's like this new exodus is actually going to happen. In our few remaining minutes, uh, well, I'll give you some other themes, actually, just to make sure you can fill out your notes. So you have the interplay of these things. They, they don't um, right belief and right practice or living. They, they go hand in hand. You can't do one without the other. Or the, or the one is, is foolishness at best. But you also have uh, highlighted in Micah chapter 2 the integration of both justice and mercy. And in God, they're perfect. And in God, they're not separated. And we are not going to stoop to the point of being false prophets or false teachers and just preach one because the other one's difficult to stomach. Sometimes we, we like to, to claim that things are not true just because they're not palatable. That is, a, that is a terrible way to determine whether or not something is true. They're, they're held together. And in, in much the same vein, you have the two-sided coin of both judgment and hope. So, what are some take-homes, some contemporary significance? Um, uh, They're just questions. 
and for you to think through. First one is this. What false beliefs, or more likely, half-truths, do I believe? And why? It's, it's, I, I would think through, as you're, as you're working your way through Scripture, and your time in the Word, what do you just want to brush aside? What is to, like, I just can't deal with that. If that's true, it's, it, it can't be true because I just can't deal with that. Why? How does accepting the things that are fun and easy and rejecting the things that are difficult and inconvenient, how does that shape our ethics? How does that shape the way we live? How does our, our stunted orthodoxy really play out in our orthopraxy? Two. Who do you and I most like listening to? Who are our preferred prophets today? And then why do we like listening to them? Whether it's a pastor or an author or some sort of authority figure. Who do you love listening? Who do you, if you were to like just, I, I, I just need some inspiration or I need some truth, I'm going to go to X. Who is he or she and why? What are their credentials? And I'm not talking about academic training. I'm talking about like, like a biblical prophet. They did two things. This is how you know they're a prophet. They always tied it back to the covenant and to faithfulness to God. And two, if they predicted anything, it came true. And if it doesn't, kill them. Those are the two quali qualities of a good prophet in the, in the Bible. I don't know how many of you have someone who's making like predictions in your life. But we can definitely work with that first one. Do, they, do, do those who you love to listen to, do they regularly point to the scriptures, to the sovereign decree of the Lord and to his, his insistence that we obey him as we follow him? Or do they just make me happy? Is it always kind of just a, a message of warm and fuzziness that I really enjoy listening to? And I always just, I feel better. I feel better. I'm really, I'm, I don't want to be a guy who's always got to have some hard-cutting message, but I, I, would, I would err on that side way more than I would ever just come in here and, and pump you up. One of my favorite um, pastors, he's not here, he's, he's in, in Texas actually, he says uh, he knows it's a good, he, that he's really preached the message faithfully if at some point in his sermon someone in the back row gets up, flips him off, and storms out. He just, he's like, I feel like I've really preached the gospel at that point. If I at least made someone mad. He said, I get really concerned when I get no feedback and everyone is just fawning over me. He's like, I don't know. Did I just spoon feed them sugar? Maybe, maybe not. So who do you like listening to and why? And then uh, out of John, how do you go about listening for the shepherd's voice? whether that's in prayer, whether that's in scripture, whether that's getting wise counsel from a brother or a sister that has the spirit of God in them. How do you go about discerning the, the shepherd's voice and responding in faithful obedience? Because um, while Micah is fighting from kind of the underbelly of society, he is in no privileged position. He's certainly going to be subject to many of the same abuses that he sees his um, his fellow countrymen um, falling to. But he doesn't see, because he's a citizen of the, the heavenly city, he doesn't see the trappings of the earthly city as all that glamorous or attractive. And I hope that that's true for me. And I hope that when it's not, I have good people around me to call me on it. I have true prophets, true teachers that are interested in my holiness more than my happiness. I think holiness actually produces happiness over the long term. Maybe not in the short run, though. But I don't want to be happy and not be holy, so difficult truths are worth 
dealing with. And Micah 2 shows us some of how that's done. Let me pray, and we will be done tonight. Father, we are grateful for the words of your prophets. We're grateful that in them we see a devotion that is inspiring. In them we see a tenacity for the things that you care about that moves me to be the same. In them we see that though they are often scared, you sustain them. I don't even want to call them brave. They're just trusting. You sustain them. Teach us to love your words like that. Teach us to follow you like that, even when the cost is very high. We are grateful. We trust you. And as citizens of the heavenly kingdom, the heavenly city, we believe that you will sustain us to the end. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.